You got the largest uh, collection of Gettysburg movie props and artifacts and memorabilia. And see if they'll bring a few things out that day as well. So our speaker today is John Banks. John is the author of three books on the Civil War. His work has been featured in such notable publications as New York Times, Civil War Times, Civil War Monitor, Civil War News, American Civil War, Military Images. Thanks for asking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> John attended Mount Lebanon High School, did it, Sarah, and graduated from West Virginia University. A longtime journalist with the Dallas Morning News at ESPN, and he's secretary treasurer of the Center for Civil War Photography, and a board member with the State Historic and Human Foundation and Battle of National Trust. John has been burning up the airwaves with his new podcast uh, with his cohort and our good friend Tom McMillan, the Antium and Beyond podcast. I encourage all of you to give that a listen wherever you find, wherever find podcasts to listen to. Uh, I, I catch up on my road trips to work. It's a lot of fun listening to them. Um, I don't know how many of you follow John on social media, but I highly encourage it. Uh, he's a lot of fun. He's a good friend. I'm happy he was able to join us here today to talk about his newest book, A Civil War Road Trip of a Lifetime in Tino Gettysburg and Beyond. He does have several copies for sale in the uh, back of the room here, so I hope you'll check that out. I call him the Jack Kerouac of uh, Civil War Historians, so I'll take it. My friend, uh, John Banks. <laughs> Hey, Eric, thank you for having me here. Um, rode nine hours in Nashville yesterday. As soon as I crossed the border from West Virginia into Pennsylvania, I thought about kissing the ground. Yeah. <laughs> Great state kingdom, I call it, of Western Pennsylvania. Uh, I grew up here in the 1970s. Uh, as John Eric said in Mount Lebanon, it was an epic time to live here as a kid. Uh, Steelers winning four Super Bowls, the immaculate reception. Pitt football was good. I went to West Virginia, so I have no fondness for Pitt any longer. Uh, the Pirates were actually a winning team. Like to accept them on 79, right? Let's do it. So I uh, had a deep love for Pittsburgh, and uh, yesterday when I got here, I didn't make a beeline to go see my sister. Made a beeline for the Banks family homestead on Old Farm Road. Where my parents lived for 47 years, and it was a very emotional experience to be there. I love this place, so it's such a thrill for me to be back here doing this. So thank you very much. The books are uh, $30, I have to mention that. All the money goes to my wife, Steve. I do not keep any of them. So anyway, and a shout out to Cindy, my friend. Cindy, you're the best. Thank you so much. All right. This is what I'm going to do. I am not a right flank, left flank person. Uh, went to West Virginia University the best 13 years of my life. Uh, and I get mixed up going left out of our house. Okay? So I'm going to give you, first of all, I'm going to tell you why I had it, a deep interest in the Civil War. Then I'm going to give you some snapshots of some of the stories that I tell in the book. And growing up on Old Park Road in Mount Lebanon a long time ago, we had a neighbor. My sister does not remember this. Who invited us over to see his summer vacation photos. So I want you to think of me as your annoying neighbor. As I take you around the country. <laughs> Before we get there, though, I have to introduce you to the most important person in my life, Mrs. B. She's in the middle. <laughs> she often says, I am on your left. Okay. She's a character in the book. Uh, I can't do this without her. She will be here today. Uh, 
uh, but she uh, says it's much more quiet at home without me. I had a conversation with her this morning, so I think she's glad. All right, my interest in the Civil War. Probably predestined. I went to Julia Ward Cal Elementary School, Malibu. Um, went there through fourth through the sixth grade. Julia Ward Howe obviously uh, wrote the Battle of the Republic. So I guess some of my Civil War interest is predestined, but it really took off on a long ago trip to Gettysburg when my dad bought sister and my brother a sleeve of bullets on a store on Baltimore Street. It was recently torn down. My sister didn't have any interest in the Civil War or those bullets. My brother didn't have any interest in those. And now I'm 27 years old. Obviously, we still have that sleeve of bullets in a shelf in our house uh, in Nashville. So, over the years, I would make a trip every year. I'd call it my power. <laughs> Very often, I would end up at Antietam. How many of you have been to Antietam? All right, we've got a hardcore three year. I like that. It's great. And I would go there to ride my bike. I would go there to eat at Bonnie's and the Redbird. How many have eaten at Bonnie's and the Redbird? Oh, you guys are great. Country, if they want to give away the sign, by the way, I want to take it. So I would go there and I would meet these people who were just so interesting. And here, here's one of them. This is Earl Roulette and his wife, Annabelle. And Earl, go back to Earl, his great, great grandfather, I think I have that right, on the wet farm, which borders Bloody Lane, uh, where the vortex of a lot, uh, much of the fighting took place on September 17th, 1862. Well, I got to know just a tremendous storyteller, and I would go to his house on Main Street. He was a longtime farmer, probably for five decades. And being a farmer, no matter what time of year I went to see Earl, he had the heat in his house turned up to like 85 degrees. It was nuts. It'd be like springtime, and I'd go in there, I'd be in shorts and t shirt and be sweating. But Earl was such a great storyteller. His great great grandfather, uh, this is Nancy Camel. Who worked for his great, toiled for his great great grandfather after she was freed as a slave? And Earl would, uh, uh, Earl would show me, pull out a picture of her and show it to me. He would pull this ring out that his ancestors had taken off the hand of a fallen soldier. And then he would take me out back and he would go in a very high pitched. And Earl would say, John, check this out in the back. And that's an ammunition crate that was handed down through his family. And surrounding it were artillery shells. And I asked Earl, Earl, have any of these shells been deactivated? And he'd go, oh. <laughs> Hey, Father, wasn't certain around. I mean, next time you see me, <laughs> such a fascinating guy. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I would be, I'd visit Antietam, you know, twice a year, three times a year. I would go past this place called Flare of the, and out front, if you look at the top there, it said Battle of Antietam Diorama. It's like, ah, oh, I gotta go see that. Jeez, I, I've never been here. And I met this guy, Lester Sonny Mason, just a hilarious guy. And he invested $50,000 into creating a battlefield diagram. 
fleet with all the wizarding stuff. He, he hired like an electrical engineer to wire this. It was totally nuts. And I, I kept running into these people and, oh, sorry. I kept running into these people who had these amazing stories. So I'm a longtime journalist, as John Eric told you. And I pitched to my uh, publisher, Kevin Drake, Gettysburg Publishing. I said, you know, I've got all these places I want to visit, want to go see. And, and you know, I write, I wrote a, ram, a column called Rambling in Civil War Times Magazine, where I would go to these places and find key characters. But this needs to be a book. So in between jobs and at the, with the blessing of the lovely, talented Mrs. B, went all over the country to you know, the major battlefields, Gettysburg, Antietam, but I also went to Beatonville, Virginia, and Vicksburg, and Middletown, Maryland, Memphis, and Richard filled up all over the place. And I some of the trips were, were planned, but others were pure serenity. So, all right, settle down into your seats. The annoying neighbor is going to come out right in and tell you some stories. I'm going to spotlight a few quickly, and then I'll tell you some other ones in a little bit more depth. And I would encourage, if you have any questions uh, during my talk, please raise your hand. I love the interaction with people. Uh, I think that's great. All right. This is David Rapp. I went to uh, Richmond in the course of reporting stories and met him at Fort Harrison outside Richmond. And the story is fascinating. His great, great grandfather was in a USCT regiment who fought at the Battle of New Market Heights. Not the Battle of New Market, Battle of New Market Heights. How many have heard about the Battle of New Market Heights? A very small percentage of people. I knew virtually nothing about the Battle of New Market Heights. Fought in uh, 1860. Five, I believe, or four, I'm sorry. Uh, his ancestor, his great great grandfather, was a free escaped slave who was one of 13 USC CT soldiers to earn to uh, receive a Medal of Honor for Valor at the Battle of New Market Heights. You also find this story told in the book. This is Jason Watley. He's standing in front of his house in Columbia, Maryland. Or I'm sorry, Columbia, Tennessee. And in 1863, an epic Confederate wedding was held here. John Armstrong got married here, but it was epic because Nathaniel Bedford Forrest and the notorious womanizer, Earl Van Dorn, attended the wedding. The dog that you see to the left is Finn. He is a groundhog murderer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm standing there with Jason, and he goes, and Finn's following us around throughout the house. And he goes, Finn has a habit of going out on the grounds and finding groundhogs, killing them, and dropping them at the of house deaths, which I thought was pretty unusual. Um, this is a fabulous house, by the way, completely restored. It's called Rally Hill, and it's in Columbia, uh, Tennessee. Also tell the story of venturing deep into the woods with my friend uh, uh, Tim, who showed me around the New Market Heights battlefield, which is uh, protected, but it's very hard to get to. We were, uh, it was a 100 degree 
day as we explore that battle new. And then a little bit of serendipity on my way to Richmond, met this couple, Charlene and Ed Krebs, uh, on the Trevelyan Station battlefield. And how many have been to Trevelyan Station? Uh, very few. The reason it was interesting to me is because George Armstrong Custer had his wagon captured, and in the wagon, had his underwear and his love letters to his beautiful wife, Libby. And I was fascinated by the story. And as I pulled into Trevelyan Station that day, it was like 102 degrees. And Ed and Charlene were hauling in a bed and mattress to the replica tavern that stood there on the battlefield back in uh, 1865. And I ended up somehow hauling that bed and mattress into the tavern with them. And then they said, do you want to go see Custer's headquarters? Well, what do you think? I said, no, absolutely. And if you remember the commercial, the Maytag commercial from the 1970s and 80s, we all remember that. Lonely guy. They have their docents at the, uh, Custer's headquarters. Very few people show up. And I think they were supremely thrilled that I happened to show up that day. And they spent two hours showing me around Custer's headquarters. One more snapshot here. This is Jerry Potter. He's standing. Uh, near the Mississippi River. He is one of the foremost experts in the country on the Sultana disaster. April 1865, the war is effectively over Sultana, north of Memphis, about seven or eight miles, explodes. It's carrying roughly uh, 2,000 passengers. Uh, most of them are parole soldiers from Andersonville, from Cahaba. Uh, many of them, uh, a little more than a thousand of them end up dying in the explosion or, or drowned in the Mississippi River. <clears throat> and here is one of my favorite people, Ron Palm, who owns a museum in Gettysburg. How many have been there? Pretty impressive photo collection that Ron has, and his story is told in the book too. Right, skip that. Um, and then before I get to the, the more in-depth stories, I am a little odd, and my sister can attest to that, right, Marian? I am the black sheep of the family. Uh, one of the stories in the book, uh, one of my friends, Laura and Alstein Rowan, is a uh, Lincoln aficionado. And on, she lives in a house on Main Street in Sharpsburg. It dates to 1780. The house was struck by federal artillery on September 17, 1862, during the Battle of Antietam, and three Confederate soldiers were killed in her house. She's also a huge Lincoln fan. So on her wall in her house, she has a Framed Oreo cookie with the Lincoln profile and white icing. <laughs> so I went to Laura and I said, Hey, Laura, what if we retrace Lincoln's route to Sharpsburg and we take along his Oreo cookie with us and explore all these sites? And she's as an adequate sense of humor and said, let's do it. So we retraced Lincoln's route to Antietam in October, 1862, visiting Harper's Ferry, uh, visiting the battlefield, visiting where Burnside met Lincoln over on Mill Road. Uh, we went to the Grove Farm, private property. Do not trust that. 
Um, <laughs> we were there with land ownership. <laughs> so do not trust me. Um, which was a real treat to see that. So anyway, all right. I can tell you about some of my favorite stories in the book. And if I end up being too annoying, please raise your hand. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I'm in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, my aim was to go explore Castle Pinckney in Charleston Park. And uh, how many have you been to Charleston? Uh, all right. Uh, presumably, you visited Fort Sumter, you know, Fort Moultrie, some of the other sites there. Castle Pinckney is on a slip of land called Chute Folly Island, and it's owned by the SCB. They bought it, and I'm not kidding, for uh, 10 bucks Confederate money. Uh, in the 1990s, I believe. But it's a fascinating place. It's unoccupied by human beings, but it is occupied by thousands and thousands of pelicans. And we all know what pelicans produce, right? It's, it's, another, it's another scene. When I visited there with, with Matthew, an Englishman, um, we had to take a flat bottom bass boat, uh, a bass boat, out into the harbor, roughly a mile and a half. And the boat was super small. And we're going on a day in which the weather was suboptimal. And I looked down at my feet, and there's a small, it's about yo big. Uh, life preserver. I can't swim. Um, and it was a very interesting experience getting out there. And part of the reason Matthew and I wanted to go there is he's a then and now aficionado. And this is uh, Charleston Zoo posing on the site where Matthew was holding that image. It was an amazing experience being out there. There you see some of the pelicans flying. You can see some, some of what remains from Castle Pinckney. And this, by the way, is where uh, some of uh, federal soldiers captured at Bull Run were in prison for a brief time in uh, 1861. We limbo dance into the entrance of the Castle Pinckney. And I cannot tell you how bizarre this scene was. The fort, there's some pelicans, my friends. <laughs> the fort is all at the time was almost entirely overgrown. And as we're walking around, Matthew goes, be careful. There is a cistern around here. And all of a sudden he plunges into not the cistern, but a somewhat deep valley. And it was a uh, interesting experience, to say the least. Uh, there is Matthew adjusting the webcam on the flag at Castle Pink. All right, this perhaps is my most entertaining story in the book, from my standpoint. How many have been to the Battle of Champions Hill? The Champion Hill Battle. One person. It was fought May 16, 1864. It's in rural Mississippi, roughly 25 miles east of Vicksburg. It's a pivotal battle uh, leading up to the eventual siege of, of Vicksburg in, in 1863. And I met on the battlefield that day, Sid Champion V. One of the ultimate characters. His great great grandparents, uh, slaveholders, owned a one of the largest plantations that, uh, in Mississippi at the time. And uh, the battle was fought, you know, basically on on their property. 
And Sid took me around, he, he's quite the character, took me around the battlefield that day on the back of his ATV. And let me tell you about Sid. He's going down the old Jackson Road here, which is a wartime road. And when you're with Sid, ducking when you see a tree is personal responsibility. Okay? As we're going down this road, there are trees. Uh, there was a recent storm. There are trees over top the road. He is zooming as fast as he can down the old Jackson Road, not telling me to duck as we're going. And you can only imagine what that was like that day. I was so nervous after this trip that I think I needed uh, copious amounts of value after my trip. <laughs> Here's Sam standing before witness tree. How many people love witness tree? Do you, do you have Dave, do you have a witness tree when you're not about to? Okay. You know, I, I've done that, sadly. Um, but but Sid goes, do you buy a punk of witness tree? He, this is a witness tree to the Battle of Champion Hill. He pulls out a punk, he slaps it on the ground, knocking all the fire ants off it. He goes here. And you can imagine where that hunk of witness tree is now. Mrs. B will never ever let a hunk of witness tree into our house. I've got it in our garage. <laughs> there it is in our garage. Hunk of battle of champion. There said, he's just, a, again, he's a remarkable character. Um, if you ever have a chance to go to the champion hill battle, Highly encourage it. Here he is uh, standing in one of the uh, Union burial trenches, which you can still see deep in the woods on the battlefield. Uh, and again, we're there on the anniversary of the battle, and I barely know this guy. And we go deep into the woods. This is one of the tributaries of uh, Baker Creek. And all of a sudden, Sid pulls out a Ruger, a Ruger pistol. And I barely know this guy, I thought he's going to shoot me. And I go, Sid, what are you doing? And he goes, looking for snakes. And he, he does that when he goes around the battle. And then he goes, that gun, I'm going to find you a pull. And he looks down at this mosaic of stones uh, on the battlefield. He didn't find me a bullet, but he often does. And for Sid, this place is one of his favorite places in the world. And we were sitting on the hill of death on the battlefield. Uh, the men's fighting took place here. And I asked Sid, I go, what does this place mean to you? And he goes, I'd rather be here than anywhere else in the world. It's a deeply meaningful, deeply meaningful place to him. All right. Have any of you followed these retreat crowd, April 1865? Very interesting. <laughs> very, it's very compelling. A lot of it. Uh, thanks to people at support trails, you find support trails markers, state markers, etc. Well, I was invited to visit a place that not many people get to see. This is in Deatonville, Virginia. It's on Lee's retreat route. This is Bachelor's Rest, and it's named for uh, a bachelor who lived here. It was a plantation house that happened to be used as a U.S. Army hospital in the waning days of Civil War before Sailor's Creek, before they surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse. This place was surreal. And the day that I got there, it, it was like something out of Rod Serpent's Twilight Zone. It was snowing, then it was raining, sun would come out, it then would be gray. And 
My intention in visiting this place was to go upstairs and on the walls of the attic, what is now the attic, federal soldiers who had been treated there scrawled their names on the walls. And the owner of this house has no intention of keeping it. So essentially it's demolition by neglect, which is really sad. The house was last occupied in the 1970s. So as I'm walking around this place, I find a closet with clothes hanging. I find a lone chair, sunlight coming through the window. I found a get well card from 1962, postcard from the 1970s, found an IRS form from 1957. It was just unbelievable. But again, the mission was to see where these soldiers had scrawled their names. And this is one of the, the gentlemen, Joshua, who served as my guide that day. And there is the attic where federal soldiers had scrawled their name. And what Michael Meehan and Joshua, the two uh, gentlemen who took me through this place, did was they had a contractor come in, they removed part of the wall in the attic with the intention of displaying it, and I believe it will end up getting displayed at Sailor's Creek. But these are the types of places that I love to go visit, the nooks and crannies places, and there are so many of these to explore. Okay. Nearby is Farmville, Virginia. And that's where the Battle of Cumberland Church, another one of those final battles during the Civil War was fought. This is site of Lee's last victory. And I got to know the farmer who owns the core part of that battle. This is Dirk Warner. Just a superior human being. And we walked the ground at the Cumberland Church Battles. Cumberland Church, uh, this is roughly uh, where the Confederate line is at. That is Nibbles, one of uh, Dirk's cows that I came close with. <laughs> and what was super interesting to me is that a Pennsylvania soldier who was uh, serving there as a bugler, Joseph Law, you can see in the bottom left hand corner, here he is in the regimental history with his, uh, with his brothers, who also served uh, in the Civil War, two of his other brothers. He was uh, tragically killed on the battlefield right where Dirk was walking. Um, Dirk uh, knows that uh, Joseph Law was buried right off to the right. He's hopeful of sometime in the near future taking some ground penetrating radar and finding where the remains of Joseph Law are buried. And Dirk has gotten to know one of the descendants of Joseph Law who was so impressed by his uh, eagerness to tell the story of this long, this forgotten battle, and he gave two original images of Joseph Law to Dirk, who he has uh, put in his house there in Farm Mill, Virginia, which is on the battle. It's Dirk and I drinking some bourbon. So. <laughs> All right. How many of you have been to Middletown, America? All right. One of those sort of out of the way sites. Um, I became super fascinated with a house along uh, the main road in uh, Middletown. And during the war, a family named the, the Rudys uh, lived there. And they became known for, uh, this house became known as a place where an officer in an Ohio regiment was treated 
Rutherford B. Hayes. And if you know your presidential history, he was, help me out, John Eric, 18th president, 19th? 19th. Uh, Rutherford B. Hayes is wounded at the Battle of South Mountain. I'll put the boxes there. Uh, the ground where he lay wounded, he can still walk back. It's very good. He ends up in this house in a bedroom on the second floor. So I had to see that bedroom. I had to see. There's Rutherford and his wife, Lucy. That's a pretty poor photo. There he is during the war. So I knocked on the door and I asked a couple who lived there, and I come in. <laughs> they looked at me a little, a little scant, sort of like give or blow up, a whistle in front of the dog, and the dog goes like this. That's how they looked at me. But then they invited me in. Super nice couple with a super fascinating story to tell. This is Donald Shang. He was in his 80s at the time. He had been born in this house. His father had been born in this house. And what he holds there is a really neat uh, artifact, uh, piece of memory, Civil War memorabilia. After the war, you know, Hayes is here for a period of time in the Rudy house. Hayes' son comes back to the house and gives Donald's grandfather, I believe, I think I have that right, a, an image of Rutherford B. Hayes. And Donald, the day that I was there, brought that out. Well, the big, the big challenge for me that day was, was to muster up the courage to ask Lois Shang whether I could see her. And she finally goes, yeah, go ahead. It's okay. And I walked upstairs, and I don't know about you guys, but when I go to these places, there's something profound about if you're on a Civil War battlefield, exploring these places, and walking in the footsteps of these people, there's something profound about that, isn't there? Like when, when you know. Like, for example, David Atchison killed at Gettysburg. There's a rock at Gettysburg where David was buried for a period of time. He's buried in Washington, PA. I was going to stop there yet, but I didn't have enough time. There's something profound about being someplace where something momentous happened or just being in the footsteps of something like this. And I was talking to my podcast partner, Brady, Tom and him. We're on, we're on video, right? <laughs> Tom mentioned it. Well, we were in a bar in Boonesboro, Maryland, talking about how you either get it or you don't. I have a brother-in-law who doesn't get the civil war. Well, we all get it, right? You get it. Is there anybody here who doesn't get it? Anybody? Um, so these places that I write about in the book are all, it's deeply meaningful to go to these places. They, they mean something. Um, so when I went upstairs, to the bedroom where Hayes recuperated from his uh, Battle of South Mountain. That was really special. And in that room, he used to stare out the window looking at the National Road with one of the Rudy's sons, Charlie. And they used to watch the soldiers, Union soldiers, march up and down the road. And if you've been to Middletown, Maryland, it looks, take away the power lines, it looks roughly the same. And what's interesting to me about when I looked in that room, I didn't just see Rutherford B. Hayes, I saw Charlie. 
And Charlie ended up dying of typhus months months later. But to see that, to look into that room, see that history, and feel that history is very, a very profound experience. All right. This guy right here is Richard Clinton. I call him in the book my Civil War Papa. And I first met him in 2012 at the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Antietam. Uh, we met like I meet most people. Uh, I met him online. Don't tell him, don't tell him this is either. <laughs> Um, he's lived in Washington County his entire life. He is a uh, longtime relic hunter, and some of you may agree with relic hunting. There are others who are profoundly, very good using that word, here, profoundly against it. And I understand both viewpoints. He's one of the what I would call ethical relic hunters documents everything, gets landowner's permission. Uh, that's Richard and I, we're at Fort Burnside Bridge. Richard has also motivated me as a storyteller. And every time I go to Antietam, I visit with, I visit with Richard and we visit the nooks and crannies of the battlefield. And he's always telling me stories. We go to the Fry House, supposedly the Clellan's headquarters. Well, if you ask Tom Clellan's uh, an authority with Antito, he people immediately uh, disagree. <laughs> and, you know, we go by the Fry House, and Richard would say, back in the 1960s, my brother in law and I, or my, my brother and I found thousand bullets here and I heard you know X here. He's just a great storyteller, deeper, deeply religious man. So when I'm around him, I do not swear. Pray lightly and straight. One of the places that we visit is the Otho J. Smith Park. And it, how many of you are familiar with Alexander Gardner's images of Antino? You've seen that? One of the photos that he took was on this farm. And you can go there today, looks roughly the same. That barn, of course, is not there. And in talking with Richard, we visited this many times. Or we're usually, typically, the only people there. And you, this is another one of those places where you can feel civil. Okay. You can feel it. Sharpsburg, Maryland, this battlefield, to me, it's like 1862 underneath the ball, right? Just take, take the monuments away from the battlefield. And as I tell uh, friends of mine, if a soldier went back to Antietam, you take those monuments away, he would, he would recognize. So Gardner took the images there in 1862, and Richard found one of his most incredible relics there. He was out there, uh, this is a hill, uh, some distance away from where the barn was. He was metal detecting that day with landowner's permission. And he was only there for a short time, and he got a signal for what you see on the right. That little disc, and it's roughly the size of a quarter. And the so it was a soldier, it was owned by a belonged to a soldier from Vermont named William Siegel. And to find one of them, uh, I don't know any of you are relic, any of you relic hunters, by the way, anybody? Um, finding one of these. For a, during a lifetime of relic honey is pretty amazing. Richard has found three of them, which is the equivalent of me walking outside and getting struck by lightning. 
three times. It's really amazing. Richard, and I tell the story in depth in the book, uh, ends up tracing uh, descendants of William Seymour. William was wounded in the fighting at Bloody Lane, owned by Earl Rudolph's great, great grandfather, William. He ends up being taken to the Otho J. Smith farm. He dies. Uh, Richard theorizes that his body was taken to that hill, buried there. It was removed after, uh, in the years after the war, uh, returned to New York, not Vermont, where he's buried today. And somehow, that relic you see right there was, was in the ground for Richard to find in the late 1980s. It's a, to me, it's an amazing story. We took that back there on that very site that where William Seymour was buried. And Richard let me pull that just amazing relic. It was really very good. All right. Does anybody have any questions before I get to one final? Go ahead. So what was that made of? That was a dog. That was made of brass. The uh, soldiers purchased them from settlers for a, for a buck. They often had several of them made. Uh, some Richard has found one that was on the Gettysburg retreat route that was roughly that small and made of silver, <laughs> extremely rare, and one that he uh, found. It's, it's, it, it's really thin, and it also had the name of the soldier. It's really interesting. All right. How many of you like to eat? <laughs> Raise your hand. <laughs> okay. Um, again, what I want to do with the book, what I'm hoping to achieve is a couple of things. One, these places that I visit, as I've already said, have a profound meaning to me. Okay? And they, they, they do to, to many of you. But I wanted to impart with the reader what it's like to go visit these places, okay? What it's like to go to Sharpsburg and where, where, where you go eat. The people that I meet there, who many of the people I found who live on these battlefields have amazing stories to tell. And so whenever you go to these places, and I tell my, my grown daughters this, Schmoozing is 98.6% of the money. Okay. The other 20% is BS. Okay. And that's it. That's that doesn't add up, but does that add up in your That does not add, add up. I'm like Yogi, I'm like Yogi Berra too. Um so when you go to these places, don't just sit in your car. And I'm assuming that you are all. Pretty hard. Don't just sit in your car. Get out. Talk to people, particularly the people who live in these places. And I think you'll be rewarded with some really wonderful stories. Now, about the food. I love to eat. I am a huge eater. So I'm going to leave you with this. These are my top five road trip east places. Number one, the beach Park, Vicksburg, Mississippi. A great place to eat. The best steaks you're going to get. Way better than Ruth Chris Steakhouse. And I'm glad a member of our audience is taking it here. I guarantee 100% Number two, the press semi-official restaurant of the Antietam and the Yacht Podcast. Tom will appreciate me mentioning that. Great Italian food. Number three, Bonnie's at the Red I'm hopeful of getting a free slice of banana cream pie. 
Bodies of the Red Bird, which is with Eric, John Aaron. Um, yeah, some people don't like it, but I'm going to give you bad. Number four, Walker's Diner in Farmville. I've eaten, uh, I've eaten pancakes, eggs, and sausage. About 32 degree weather out in the cold there. Couldn't get a seat in the diner. That was really good. And number four, Mechanicsville, Virginia, Carter's Pig. Some of the greatest barbecue you're ever going to get. Thank you so much. And there's Mrs. B. There she is. Awesome. That was exactly the one hour of seeing the screen. All right, I'll entertain any questions. Thank you for having me. This is really, for me, being here in the kingdom of Western Pennsylvania. It's a deep, and I'll use the word profound honor. Thank you for having me. Can you just repeat the questions when you get them so people on here can hear? I can do Anybody got a question? Even my sister. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, the Law Brothers. Yes. Give a picture of. What were their names again? Because we have four we the word in the one word. Yeah, one was Joseph. And the image is in the regimental history. Well, uh, you can see the names there. Uh, that's directly from the regimental history. One was Charles, one was Joseph. Joseph was the future. And then I would go in front of I don't know if I saw the video. Um, yeah, and the question again was what was the name for Phoenix or John Harris? The names of the soldiers. Yeah, it's right there. If you're looking in the book, uh, it's a very small image that has all the names. Again, Charles, Joseph, and the other brothers in the upper uh, upper right hand corner. His name is Dave. Right Perhaps. It might have been. It might have been. Yeah. Yeah. The regimental history is fascinating. Yes, sir. <laughs> you and I love it. Uh, but everyone else is getting for everything else. You talked about you know, the stewardship of the land, which has been a lot of work before that. What was really the thing, your aha moment, your first visit, your first that really cemented and keyed them as your? Yes, that's a great question. I'll repeat it. What event, what moment cemented my interest in it? My first newspaper gig, I'm a former ink stain wretch. I went to the digital side of the business in 1998, so I'm all messed up. My first newspaper gig, uh, is anybody here from Martinsburg, West Virginia? Good. It was a God for saving place. Um, <laughs> I took the way to leave and I got out of there in a year and a half. But I ended up doing a store. I did virtually nothing about the battle in Tito. And I went there. Uh, to do a story about um, the Miller farm, and it was owned at the time by the Color. Paul Color had farmed that ground from the 1940s to the 1980s. And I go down there to do a story, and when I pull up into the driveway, it's still you know, the driveway is still there at the Miller farmhouse. The, it's a, it, it was there in 1862. He had a table full of records. All the stuff, you know, a fraction of the stuff that he had found on the battlefield over the years. Gun parts, bullets, you know, pieces of artillery shells. And that really had, that had a deep effect on me. And, you know, to me, I don't know about you guys, but when I go to these places, it's like, all right, I've been there, now I want to read something. And then you go back, then you want to read some more. It's what I call a virtuous cycle. Okay. And then it's, you'll never get out. It's like being in a washing machine forever. Um, so that, that's a very good question. Nobody's ever asked. Anybody else in China? 
What's on your bucket list? Where haven't you been that you want to go? A couple of weeks ago, where have I been? I was just asking this question that I would like to go. A few weeks ago, this is being I went to the Cherry Blossom Festival in uh, Marshfield, Missouri. Uh, there's a run around there that throw the roll in the above that you call the Ambrose. So I've been to Wilson Creek. That was, I wanted to go there. The Ridge is next. I want to go to the Ridge. I don't want to take it. But this is the one I'm going to trip. I definitely want to go there. That's a good question, too. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I like a, like a dog tag or... Yeah, so the question is, the question is, what was that little disc that I showed during the uh, presentation? Soldiers would buy those on the sucklers. They would have their names stamped on them. So if they ended up falling in battle, uh, they could be identified later. There were no dog tags. In this. So individually, soldiers would go to the settlers to follow the armies and they would have them created by you know settlers or order of fifty cents. Correct. And they're very small, roughly the size of a yes sir. What are those called? Um I need this. Sir. What is your favorite movie based on this? Oh, <laughs> yeah, like, well, I mean, um, and the question is, what is my favorite movie about such a war? You know, when I'm down some days, I'll, I'll go on YouTube and put Gettysburg on, even though it's you know, a lot of inaccuracies. And I mean, who, the 20th main scene, who cannot be motivated by that? Literally, the last time I watched it, I had a response. So it's a, I guess that's a default movie, I guess. So, any, anybody else? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Time I was in, have I ever, ever been in dangerous situations? I haven't got shot at. Some of my friends have relevant. There's one guy at uh, Brown's Ferry in Tennessee told me he's been shot at. Um, that trip to Castle Pitney that day, Mrs. B was out on tour in Sidewind Street. It was nuts. And I'm out of Castle Pitney. There's lightning. From Shrews Valley, I'm looking at St. Michael's Church for Robert Good Worship in George Washington with lightning above the church. And um, I was returning to shore on that flat, flat bottom bass boat that I mentioned, that really tiny boat. It was storming. And I was so, I mean, my hands were shaking by the time we got to shore. And with Michael, we ended up at a, at a bar, big shot. And uh, there was a woman in there her name pink and green yoga suit. Yeah. And then I was just, we, I just had a drink like two quick videos. Yes. Do you have a line for the Yes. Um, I explained that in the book. The Mississippi River changed course in the decades after the war. Sultana now rests underneath a farmer's soybean. And the gentleman that I described him really briefly, so I had to move it along. He he knows where it's at. He's obsessed with it, and he's found a lot of documents. That's a good question. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, sir. In the book, I went on a ghost story in Gettysburg. You have to buy the book. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Let's give a uh, good draw one more. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Thank you.
Thank you for coming out today. We'll be back here June 8th with my crowds for the last meeting before summer break. So come back for that one. I'm sure John would be happy to talk to you. Please buy a book. And uh, thank you all for coming out. We'll see you next month. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.